Hi, I'm Jill Wood, the CEO of Phoenix Ness. Um, Phoenix Ness is a small niche biotech focused on treatments for San Filippo syndrome. I'm also Jonah's mom. Jonah is a 14 year old boy affected by San Filippo syndrome. I'd like to thank Dr. Eckstein um, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. My talk, I thought I'd share with you my family's story and our mission to drive the science towards a treatment for San Filippo syndrome um, for the families and the children affected by this insidious disease. Uh, my hope is that I'll be able to inspire you and maybe show you the other side of the bench. Someday you might be looking at a child's pluripotent stem cells and remember that this came, who these came from and why you're here and who you're helping. So at Jonah's first year well visit, our pediatrician suggested that we get Jonah an MRI based on the side of size of his head circumference. It wasn't for another seven months that we actually had the MRI done. At that point, we thought that Jonah was perfect and every way he was a happy, um, very energetic young toddler. So we finally get in to have the MRI, which was done at um, NYU, where the clinicians there and the techs knew what they were looking at immediately. Unbeknownst to me, there was trials going on there for other MTSs. So Jonah had a J-shaped cella, perivascular spaces, lesions, and um, his large head ended up being a um, skull deformity, frontal lobe bossing. Um, this is my son, Jonah Hare. He's about two years old in this picture with another San Filippo child. Um, actually, this was in France, uh, where you can see the, the large head. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, oopsies. Uh, Jonah was uh, finally diagnosed with San Filippo syndrome type C. It is one of the mucopolysaccharidoses, which there are seven. Um, these MPSs also break down into subtypes, hence Jonah is type C. He was diagnosed at 22 months. And to our knowledge, he is the youngest child to have been diagnosed with uh, type C without having an older sibling diagnosed first. This small, um, early, very early diagnosis really gave us a chance to fight Jonah's fate. Unbeknownst to us, you know, he was only two. He did have words. He was meeting his milestone, but he could not hear. We didn't, and we had no idea Jonah was our first child. Um, and because of the MPSs, our clinicians knew what symptoms to treat immediately, and that was the um, hearing. So his ears were filled with fluid. We put grommets in there and the fluid just started rushing out, you know, immediately. He was pointing out new things. We're in Brooklyn, you know, we have the airport, <laughs> JFK um, planes fly flying over us and he was pointing out planes. Um, the early diagnosis also uh, set him up for early intervention. He started preschool at three years old. He got speech therapy five days a week, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, all these interventions really set the stage to help his speech um, and his behavioral issues. So, you know, it's a lot of clinicians out there might think you, you shouldn't diagnose. <laughs> it's hard to give a diagnosis at such a young age with no treatments available. But really this diagnosis, I believe, put my son so much further ahead of the game than he would have been if he were diagnosed at six years old, which is the common age for San Filippo syndrome type C to have been diagnosed. Um, San Filippo syndrome is one of the largest, larger, is in the larger umbrella group of lysosomal storage diseases. And as you know, these are inborn error, errors of metabolis, metabolism um, that have an accumulation of GAGs. In San Filippo syndrome, the GAG is heparin sulfate. As I mentioned, there are four subtypes with four different enzymes that 
cause the um, the substrate to build up because of a, a mutation there. Jonah um, enzyme is Kate Snap. The at birth, these children appear very normal, hence it's extraordinarily hard to diagnose these kids at a very young age. They have as when they get older, you might start noticing the coarse facial features. These kids um, have fleshy ears, fleshy eyes, large lips. Um, here's another San Filippo type C child here as well. And you can see these um, similarities in our kids. They have upper respiratory issues, mu lots of mucus, um, chronic ear infections, like I mentioned, diarrhea, um, hyperactivity, the percent with hyperactivity and speech delays and hepat hepatosplomeglia is evident at birth too. So, you know, a lot of these areas can all be brushed off by you know, pediatricians because they're, they're common. You know, get, you have ear infections, toddlers have ear infections all the time. You give them meds and they have diarrhea and kids are hyperactive. Um, the San Filippo children though, they take the hyperactivity to the next level. Okay, well, I lost this chair. Oh, here we go. Um, so San Filippo syndrome primarily affects the central nervous system. It's a fatal neurodegenerative syndrome and it doesn't have any approved treatments. Uh, early behaviors, it's very much focused on the behaviors with these uh, children when they're toddlers. You <laughs> might think, oh my, you know, my terrible two child was, was crazy. This is, you know, par from the course. But no, these, these kids really take it to the next level. This is my son who's at somebody else's house, mind you who has pulled out all the pots and pans out of the cupboard, thrown them on the ground and climbed in there. Um, they're very affectionate kids, very loving. And I put that right next to aggressive because when they don't get what they want, it's a knockdown, drag out, temper tantrum, kicking, screaming, pulling their hair. Um, I live in Brooklyn, it's a very crowded place. I've had people t stop me on the, on the street asking me if I need help. Um, lecturing my son for being a bad kid and you know you feel like this parent like what's going on with my child am I a bad parent um, but no it's San Filippo syndrome but quickly the kids start to decline and you start to miss that hyperactivity uh, they start to lose the skills most mostly the speech is affected first but these children, I should mention too, they usually don't um, speak in full sentences. They don't have back and forth conversation with you. They have very rote sentences. Uh, they have increasing gait issues where they're a little, they're clumpy, clumsy, you know, toe walking, um, in toe walking. Their knees come together. Um, and so those things become more and more apparent. Then they'll also have chewing and swallowing issues. Their epiglottis does not function properly as the CNS disorder kicks in. Um, it, so this could lead to aspiration pneumonia very easily. Then kids, if you're really unlucky, the seizures will, will start within the first decade of life. Um, Another really awful eh, symptom of this disease is unexplained periods of crying. Um, they will cry and act like they're in pain, writhing back and forth, crying nonstop, um, and leaving the families beside themselves. They'll take them to all the experts out there to come up with nothing. Um, yeah, and so then in the final stages, the children die. Uh, they'll live, you know, they can live up to 40 years with palliative care. Uh, they usually, they, it's the wear and tear of seizures um, and pneumonia, as I mentioned, are actually what um, kill these kids. So, 
on Jonah's diagnosis, you know, again, he was very young. He was only 22 months old. Uh, and it was quite the shock to my, my husband and I, my husband and I, uh, and I asked our geneticist, you know, if this was a death, a death sentence and she paused for a very long time and I <laughs> hated myself for asking the question, but she came back and she said, you know, there are treatments today that were never dreamed possible 10 years ago. And that's really all I needed to hear to hit the ground running. Um, we went home. I called my husband's brother-in-law, who was or my brother-in-law, um, who was a lawyer, and he started. He created our nonprofit for us. Social media was a blessing. We got on Facebook, got our website, um, and started locating the families. They just started coming out of the woodwork. Um, I called. I <laughs> started reading all the. Uh, papers out there written on San Filippo syndrome. And I called the cold called the investigators and um, told them my story. And this gentleman here, uh, Alexei Pajetsky, was actually one of the scientists that discovered the mutation on chromosome eight that led, led to San Filippo type C. And I, I called him and uh, he didn't return my call for a month. I was devastated. Come to find out, he was climbing the Himalayas. You know, this is this is my go-to researcher here, um, and he said, "You know, I I've just been waiting for somebody to come along and say, hey, let's do this." And so we had my husband and I, while in that month, while we were waiting for him to call us back, we started fundraising, and we immediately we gave him some funding for to create our knockout mouse. We found um, another researcher, Brian Bigger from Manchester University, who was also very much interested in the San Filippo syndromes. Um, we brought these guys together a year later to um, here at Columbia University for our first patient population meeting. And we sat down with a handful of families that we had gathered that were like-minded and really wanted to fight our children's fate. Um, and we sat down over two days and just really hammered out that what it was that we were going to go after. Um, primary focus was gene therapy. Alexi had already had some ideas about chaperones. Um, we have one clinician over here, Maria Escalar, who you know really advocated for starting our natural history study and really pulling these families together and characterizing the disease. Um, Together with these families, we created a consortium called, we call ourselves HANDS, um, of families of patient organizations around the world. And together we started fundraising for our gene therapy programs and um, chaperone programs. Meanwhile, our researchers went home and they started hiring their postdocs. So we were off and running. Um, I want, to, I want to bring this up. So, you know, it's been 13 years now that I have been doing this. It's been a very, very hard road. I don't um, suggest, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really difficult. It's like you, you have these children that have terminal diseases and you're compelled, you wanna save them, you wanna help the next generation, but then on the, on the other hand, you wanna spend child, time with your children. Uh, these are my partners in crime, uh, moms from France, Portugal, and Barcelona. There were four families that started this, this uh, endeavor, and two of those children are now past. We just recently lost um, Paul a couple of weeks ago. This is Paul and El and Elwin, as you can see, very affectionate children. Uh, the families are extremely in, important to me. And without them, I don't know that I could have kept on going, but uh, we're in it for the long run. So, you know, with all the mom and pop fundraising, we realized that it, we weren't gonna get to where we needed to be, you know, with these astronomical numbers for the research. And I met this gentleman who had experience writing NIH grants 
and he suggested that I form my own for-profit company. And, you know, I took a deep breath and I was like, you, I, I saw this com coming, you know. Uh, our goal at the beginning was you, the f families, you know, set the, um, give the seed money to these researchers to start the preclinical research. And then our hope was to inspire uh, a sponsor, a larger biotech, to come along and uh, license the program and take it forward for us. Um, that wasn't happening. You know, I, I traveled quite extensively, went to every um, conference there was, cold called CEOs and investors, you know, and just had my, uh, the door slammed on me time and time again, you know, your disease is too rare, your disease is too rare. So um, really, I, I realized that we were going to need a lot more help. So I did create our own for-profit company, as I mentioned, Phoenix Nest. And we did start writing grants and we were very successful in um, winning SBIR and STTR support, small business innovation research grants for small company startups like myself. Um, so we are the very proud recipient of six NIH grants. I just added this up here and I think we're almost at $13 million. I had to go back and go, really? We want a $5.6 million grant? Uh, yeah, this is, you know, I've been told time and time again that this is not a typical situation where a mother of a biotech, you know, um, starts a biotech and, and wins these very competitive grants. So um, I, this obviously I did not do this by myself. I have a, um, my degrees. People always ask me what I did in my past life. And I actually have a degree in apparel design and uh, business management. So I really kind of in the business side back end and the networker kind of the muse to drive this. Um, so we have our very collaborative group of researchers. I've been very fortunate to find people that were um, willing to reach out across the pond and to work with other researchers. We started um, fundraising for our gene therapy program, which started out with Brian Bicker in Montreal. And we, we made a collaborative grant between Brian and Alexi. And you know, years later, Brian um, commented on how rare that was to you know, make two researchers who could consider themselves competitors work together in this um, in this endeavor, which and w <laughs> I was surprised. I was really very startled to hear that, but it really made for um, great science. These guys bouncing ideas off each other, um, sharing resources, sharing postdocs. It's been a really amazing collaboration. Um, we've had several collaborations over the years. I want to mention that um, are these NIH grants actually don't fund researchers outside of the United States, which is uh, was a very difficult uh, situation for us. And I ended up licensing this program, our gene therapy program, and bringing it to the United States and working with CROs here. And then um, now with another researcher and UT Southwestern, Steve Gray. I've also had a lot of help from with pharma. Um, you know, the CEOs that turned me down for wanting to take on our program were bent over backwards to helping me, you know, providing me with the resources um, and consultants. For, for instance, um, Robert Boyd, I called him Bob the Builder, came from Amicus and really helped us out with our chaperones. Um, but our main program that we won all the grants for was an en is an enzyme replacement therapy program for MPS3D. And that is with um, Patricia Dixon, who is now at Wazoo, and Sufen Chow, who is now at Caltech. And again, um, this grant, I think we're pushing like eight years on this grant. Um, I met Patricia Dixon about eight years ago, and I had recently um, applied for 
a, a contest, a rare disease contest. I think it was Taconic that sponsored this. Uh, and the grand prize was a mouse model. And I applied for a mouse model for a 3D knockout mouse. And we actually won it. And this was before CRISPR, you know, so it was like winning a car for us. Um, and I met Patty at World, a lysosomal storage disease um, conference. And Patty was like, oh, I heard you have a 3D mouse. Can I have it? And I said, like, absolutely. Um, and we then, she had already had some clinical research on this, um, on an enzyme replacement therapy program. And so we wrote a grant together and we won, which ended up being a series um, of grants. We have four grants now and our fourth grant right now is for a natural history study, which has kicked off and we've had our first three patients in and we are expecting our international patients to start coming in the next few weeks here. So it's really super exciting. Um, this program, like I mentioned, it's been up to 10 years now. Uh, we had a lot of problems with our enzyme and um, making it grow and, synth and synthesizing uh, this enzyme. We brought in another phar uh, pharma, Consultant came in, Steve Jungles, and helped us find the right temperature and the right food for these enzymes. I mean, who knew you had to have the right temperature? These guys are very finicky. Um, yeah, but we're still hanging in there, plugging away at this program. Uh, I thank Dr. Eckstein for giving me this platform here uh, to really to give some of my grievances here. You know, I have a real chip on my shoulder with um, San Filippo syndrome being categorized as a rare disease. I have a, I have a hard time with that. Um, there's rare diseases and now there's ultra rare diseases. Nobody really um, gave ultra rare diseases the, the time of day until recently they've started to accept that, oh yeah, there are ultra rare diseases. But I think of San Filippo syndrome as a hyper rare disease. Um, so the FDA, as you may know, um, describes the rare disease of having a patient population of 200,000 people or less. Um, depending on where you look, they say there's 7,000 rare diseases or 10,000 rare diseases. I don't know. It's a lot of rare diseases to choose from when you have patient populations of 200,000. Uh, and despite all these incentives, only 5% of these rare diseases have treatments. Uh, and how many of those treatments are in the ultra rare space or the hyper rare space? Just a handful. I mean, they, for the hyper rare spaces, you know, I can only think of two treatments that are out there. Uh, so, you know, there are these incentives for pharmaceuticals to companies to pick us up. But here's where my chip is, is like when you have a patient population of 200,000 and you have San Filippo syndrome over here with you're looking at 20 patients in the United States, who are you going to create a treatment for? Um, so right now we, we have accelerated approval, you know, is the hot topic right now as with the Biogen Alzheimer's treatments, Al Duhan, who uh, received accelerated approval for their treatment. Um, and here you have, with, looking for a surrogate endpoint here with the amyloid beta plaques. And as I mentioned, San Filippo syndrome has a very strong biomarker um, surrogate endpoint, which is heparin sulfate. We've had several um, trials go ahead of us for San Filippo syndromes type A and B, which are much more prevalent for type C and D. And the FDA time and time again has come back and said, no, we don't, we're not sold on the fact that um, heparin sulfate, your biomarker, your alleged surrogate endpoint is actually disease causing because these sponsors um, had kind of, they these sponsors really, they hung their hats on um, receiving accelerated approval and convinced their investors to um, fund them, continue to fund them 
that they had a pathway forward, but then the FDA is coming back and saying, hey, you know what? You're really not showing a clinically meaningful endpoint here. You're, you're not moving the dial on, these, on your cognitive endpoints. Uh, so time and again, these trials have shut down because they ran out of funding and they decided, you know, Sanflevo was just too rare. So uh, really, I would like to go back and I would like to FDA and our legislators to relook at this, you know, look at the ultra rare diseases and the hyper rare diseases and who should these incentives really be going to? You know, uh, is it the big guys, Biogen? who are looking to make a lot, a lot of money on drugs for a very, it's not, you know, Alzheimer's is not in the least bit uh, uh, rare, but again, for accelerated approval, you don't have to be a rare disease. You have to be an unmet disease. So maybe accelerated approval should be for the ultra rare and the hyper rare um, disorders. Anyhow, that's my opinion there. So um, there are 70 types of lysosomal storage diseases, and I think there is a lot of room for collaborations here. Uh, these storage disorders, they all look very similar, how they present, and they all have a lot of overlapping treatments, the enzyme replacement therapies, um, substrate reduction, chaperone therapies, gene therapies, and then this adjuvant therapies, you know, um, triggering TFEB, these master cells to dump their loads here. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different pathways here that overlap quite a bit. And in my mind, it's like, why don't we bundle these syndromes that look a lot alike um, and researchers could work with each other, you know, who might have more experience on, you know, the, signal, the, the signaling pathways um, whereas another person, another researcher might, you know, be more, um, uh, what's my word, <laughs> have a lot more experience in, you know, in the different routes of administration, um, autophagy, you know, all these different alternate pathways here. Um, and work with, and, you know, the, there's not, like I mentioned, there's not a lot of funding for these diseases, but there are lots of not-for-profits out there. In the San Filippo syndrome space, you know, I think there's at least 15 of us who are um, fundraising towards treatments and tapping into these foundations, you know, don't be, um, what do I want, uh, intimidated to reach out to these guys. We're always looking for novel ideas and the way to, and ways to work together. And I really think that you can bundle these treatments and share mouse models and work together in um, a collaborative environment. You know, as I mentioned, gene therapies, you know, in my mind, this should just be a plug and play uh, treatment. I guess I want um, I wanted to mention, you know, another I kind of think that this is a, it's a fun side pot, um, project for us. Uh, as you know, a lot of lysosomal storage diseases cause retinitis, pigmentosis, um, a lot of vision uh, degeneration, retinal degeneration uh, with these with these storage disorders. And I was inspired by this cohort of patients out there that were um, asymptomatic who had been diagnosed by um, genome sequencing with San Filippo's type C when they were um, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 50s, they started going blind. Um, I was like, wow, <laughs> there's this whole cohort of San Filippo type C patients out there that are otherwise asymptomatic, but they're going blind. Why don't we um, use our gene therapy program and see, you know, what the distribution looks like in the ret in the retina there? So I found a uh, a researcher who um, was very interested in characterizing our mouse models, um, the retina degeneration in our mouse models, on her so on. 
and um, he wrote has already written a couple of publications. And then we decided, let's you know, let's uh, send you the eyes of our of our mice that have uh, been dosed with our gene therapy. And this was just recently we won a grant for our, our finally for our type C program. Um, a gene therapy research, and we added that into an aim that he would characterize the um, the pathology of what was happening in the uh, in the eyes of these mice after they had been uh, treated. So you know, there's there's a lot of things with Sanfilippo as there are with uh, with many of the lysosomal storage disorders. This the systemic disease all across the board and all the different tissues here, eyes just being one of them. I'm also really curious about how uh, the bones are affected with the, with the storage, you know, and also to tie into that, the CNS and these kids, as I mentioned, the mobility issues in the walking and the tripping and then ending up in wheelchairs. How does the storage play into that? Um, if I had, the bandwidth and the funding, this is definitely a um, collaborative, I see as a collaborative um, project that we could we could pull together and look at because mobility would create a really great endpoint for us.